Um, so I'm assuming that most people here are not language processing people, is that right? Other than actually Julian who just walked in because I know he is. Is the, yeah, it's put up your hands if anybody actually has done any natural language processing or computational linguistics. No, okay. A little bit, yeah? You have, okay. But most of you are kind of vision or audio machine learning type people, is that right? Ish, yes, roughly. Oh, yes, or biologists. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. So we have got quite a mixture, but not many, and no actual linguists. So I can make as many factual errors about language as I like without being picked up, which is good. So, okay. So what I will try and do um, is talk a little bit about some basic language processing techniques, so sort of ways of applying <coughs> the kinds of things that you guys are probably mostly quite familiar with. Uh, to language and try, I guess, uh, talk about a little bit what might be different about applying them to language than applying them to the kinds of problems that you're used to, like audio or video, and talk a little bit about why that becomes different again when you start looking at the language that people actually use when they're talking to each other, which, as intelligent sensing people, is probably what we in the room are mostly concerned with. We're kind of interested in finding out what's going on from the way people talk. So, first off, I thought we might just outline some of the reasons why we might be interested in this in the first place, with, as intelligent sensors. Um, it's, you guys have been spending most of your time, I'm guessing, over the last uh, few days and during your task, thinking about vision and how you can get some meaning out of the visual information or the audio information you're presented with. Um, so the question for us just for the next hour, is what kind of information might we be interested in getting out of the linguistic information that we might be presented with when we, we hear somebody talk or we see them talking to each other on something like uh, the web or social media. Uh, and there's a range of things we might want to get at. We might be interested in finding out the things that people like or the things that people dislike. This has become a big sort of commercial as well as academic research area recently with people being interested in finding out people's sentiment or people's emotions from the way they talk. We might be interested in just the topics that people are talking about. We might be interested in profiling people in terms of their areas of interest. We might be interested in finding out what people actually think. Right? We might be interested in trying to get at what their opinions are, what people seem to be for or against, what people seem to agree about or what people don't seem to agree about. Uh, we might even try and go a bit further than that and try and work out what people are going to do, given what their opinions are. See if we can actually predict people's behaviour or work out when they've kind of made a decision to do something. Uh, and if we want to go to the kind of extreme end of being good at processing language, we might even want to try and work out how to hold up our end as uh, a computer processing system of, of a conversation and actually take part in a conversation and let somebody talk to you and talk back. Uh, and of course, all of these things are things, that is, this is definitely information that's present in, in the language that you will just hear people saying. Yeah, if you go and listen to somebody's conversation, it's pretty obvious you're going to get people voicing their likes and their dislikes, talking about their topics of interest, giving you some information about what they think, giving you some information about what they've decided to do. Sorry, what's that? Oh, it's a pointer. Thank you. Is it red? Yes. I may not be able to. Does it work? The red pointer. I'll try. I'm colorblind in red, so I can't see them very well. <laughs> Quite why they chose red is the most common color. I don't know. Um, so these are the sorts of things I'm going to think about. Yeah, This sort of fits in with our general aim of intelligent sensing, trying to extract some useful, actionable information from the data that we see around us. But this is stuff that we can really only get at uh, from language. But the, it's pretty obvious, right? It's going to be present in people's normal talk. Perhaps with the exception of this thing at the end, and I suspect we're not going to have time to get on that anyway. So we can, you can come and find me and talk about it if you like. So then the next question for you guys who aren't used to the idea of processing language is, is what makes up language? What is the data that we're actually given? And how are we going to actually get at the information? Like things like likes and dislikes and opinions and decisions and so on. Um, from, the, from the data that we're presented with. And first thing you might think, right, it's not going to work for me, um, is that we've got words, yeah? So 
people talk in sentences, roughly, and they present us with strings of words. We're going to see words, and we can probably recognize them. But sentences clearly have some kind of structure. Words fall into classes. Computational linguists like myself spend a lot of time trying to attach some sort of structure to the words that go to make up a sentence so that we can understand how they go together and so we can sort of understand something about the structure and how we can attach some more interesting, deeper information to this sentence. And the first thing you might want to do is do something called part of speech tagging. So we're probably all intuitively, at least, if not formally, familiar with the idea that words sort of fall into different grammatical classes. You have things like names which sort of define, refer to objects and which can sort of stand on their own as, as names things which name something in the world and call it a proper name here. We've got things which are verbs, which talk about actions, talk about events. We've got things like this, which are nouns, that sort of describe general classes of person or thing or entity. We've got little function words, which I'm going to call something like a determiner here, which doesn't actually necessarily refer to anything in the world, but forms a very important structural uh, role in, in telling you how these phrases are made up and how they go together. But then... We've got some actual structure to how these words go together to make up phrases, which is the way that we, when processing the sentence, try and work out what it actually means, what kind of sentence it is. It's kind of clear that a and detective go together to make up some kind of phrase, right? A detective is a person now, rather than just a word, a, and some sort of class of thing, detective. Hiring a detective is a thing you can talk about, so I can call it a verb phrase here. And we can make a whole sentence of Mary hires a detective, where we know that we've got something that's the subject of some verb phrase. Right? We're not going to worry too much about how we might attach, how we might actually go about assigning this structure at the moment. But it's important to be aware that this structure is there. And it's through recognizing this structure as people that we can go about actually interpreting this string of words into some underlying actual meaning that we can do something with, we can do some inferences on, we can work out what somebody wants to do, what they're saying, and what we should do now. And similarly, computational linguists spend a lot of their time trying to work out how to transfer words into syntactic structures, how to turn them into semantic representations, and you might use all kinds of different sort of semantic representations. You might use sort of first-order logic-style formalisms like this, which tells you that what this sentence means is there is something which is an X, which is a detective and is being hired by Mary, or you might have some other kind of representation. We're not gonna, I'm not going to talk about the representations, um, so don't worry about the formalisms at all. But... There's obviously something very different about this semantic representation. This actually tells you about the structure of what's going on, who's the subject, the fact there's a hiring event, who's doing it, who's being, experiencing it, who's being hired, which we don't get directly just from the string of words. Right? There's a lot of information in the words, but we've got to do an awful lot of processing and structure recognizing if we really, really want to get to the underlying meaning of what this, even this simple sentence is. So, how do we do it? Right? Obvious question. I'm not going to tell you everything because this would take a very, very long time. But I'm going to go through some very, very basic insights into the sorts of approaches of what, that people use to sort of start approaching this problem, at least. Some really basic, simple ones, and then uh, talk about some of the more complex ones without actually going into them. So the first thing that we saw we got there is a string of words. So an obvious question to ask is how much can we do just by looking at the words without worrying about the fact that we've got these parts of speech or syntactic structures or even worrying about the fact that we're going to have semantic representations attached to them. What can we do just with the words? And there's a whole variety of approaches that actually do just work with the words and can do some really computationally useful things. And I'm sort of massively oversimplifying, but in general, they tend to use this insight that we can represent a text in a sort of geometric way as belonging to some point within a space, within a geometric space. We can call this a vector space model. We can just think of the set of all possible texts as an n-dimensional space where each dimension corresponds to a particular word in our vocabulary, in our language. So here's a representation where we have a language which only has two words in it. Let's pretend this is the dimension corresponding to the word dog this is the dimension corresponding to the word man. If we had some text which has the word dog mentioned in it a hundred times, but man only mentioned once, then we might say, well, it's got a point in space somewhere out here, and represent this as this vector. Yeah? If we've got a text that has the word 
can't remember which way around I said it now, but the other one, man or dog, lots and lots of times, but this one much less, then it's a point over here. And we can see that they lie in like, different parts of the space. Then if we're given some new text, which has some number of mentions of dog and some number of mentions of man, we can work out where it is. And it's pretty obvious that we can see which one it's more similar to, right? We can just do something like a cosine distance between the two or some other method of measuring distance in a vector space, which you're all mathematically savvy enough to do. So we can work out, we can do things like document similarity this way. And actually, it sounds really basic, but this is kind of the way that all information retrieval sort of roughly underlying still works all web search engines sort of start in this principle. We might apply different kinds of weightings to our dimensions, to all sorts of other clever things, but this is the basic insight. It can tell us how similar documents are. It can help us classify documents. We can run some sort of clustering algorithm in this sort of space. We can run discriminative classification algorithms in this, algorithms in this sort of space to classify things in categories we already know. This means you can apply all sorts of methods that you guys are already very familiar with, unsupervised learning, supervised classification, but doing it here on language. And that's really good if the text we're dealing with are things like this. Right? If we want to know that the document Dog Bites Man is similar to Dog Chases Man, we will find out that that's true, right? because most of its words are the same. We'll know it's quite similar to Dog Bites Cat. We'll know it's very unsimilar, dissimilar to Cat Eats Fish because it has completely different words in it, essentially. But it's going to be really terrible for telling us a lot of things that we are clearly going to want to do. Examples like this, where puppy is actually a kind of dog. We would want this to be extremely similar to dog bites man and very different to cat bites man. And it's not going to be, because puppy is an entirely different word. We can't know that puppy has anything to do with dog. We can't know that puppy bites man is more similar than cat bites man. We can't know that cat bites man is more similar to dog bites man than fish bites man, which it probably is. And because cats are more similar to dogs, right? And this would be a more surprising document than this one. We'd want to know that it's more dissimilar and we want to flag it up somehow if we came across it. So this kind of model, it can do an awful lot, but it falls down very, very quickly. Even if we're still just interested in kind of the meaning of words and not really interested in the structure of words, because it doesn't tell us anything about obvious things like similarities between words or dissimilarities between words. Now, there are ways of getting around this, and people have spent decades building clever ontologies of words that tell us exactly how things like puppy relate to things like dog, that one is a subclass of the other. There are, you can go and pick up useful resources called WordNet if you want to do this for sentiment analysis. There are specific ones like that, uh, SentiWordNet and General Inquiry that you can use. And these will solve this problem for you, at least if the language that you're dealing with fits into the kind of ontology that people have predicted. But immediately, and I'm sure you spotted this, we run into another problem, that we're totally ignoring any notion of sequence or structure. Any kind of model like this, however clever your ontology, however clever your dictionary, however clever your knowledge of what the word, how similar words are, can't, in principle, tell you anything to do with the difference between those two sentences, right? Dog bites man, man bites dog. One is normal and unremarkable, the other is headline news. And they mean totally different things. And that's because of the structure, because in here the man is doing the biting, and here the dog is doing the biting. But they've got the same words in, right? We can have any kind of permutation of these. So the obvious thing we, as kind of computational people, might say, well, that means we need to take word sequence into account, right? Let's not worry about attaching structure to it. We can do some pretty obvious things with sequence here, because the sequences of words there are different. And of course we can. There's a whole family of techniques which broadly are called language modeling, where the, the insight, really, what they're doing, there's lots of different clever ways of estimating these probabilities and smoothing between models and so on. All they're doing is trying to estimate, given some data that you've seen, the probability of some sequence of words. They're just trying to give you, for any word in a text, WI, the probability that you would see that word given the words that you've seen before it. It's what a language model does. It's used an awful lot in speech recognition to try and di di you know, disambiguate between the different sounds that you're making and what sort of words they might be. But it's also used an awful lot in things like document classification because if you learn a language model from one kind of document, it'll tell you that another kind of document is less probable or more probable. Actually, 
estimating the probability of word given everything you've ever seen is, of course, going to be intractable, but there's lots of obvious ways you can approximate it. You can approximate it just based on recent context. You can approximate it based on slightly longer context and so on. And again, these are the kind of models that you guys are going to be very familiar with. We can estimate it directly from data. We can smooth to give ourselves more reliable estimates and so on. We can even apply that to the part of speech tagging problem that I mentioned before. We can learn sequence models, which not only tell us about the probability of a particular element given the sequence of things you saw before, but the probability that that element lies in a particular class given the classes that we saw before, doing a kind of joint modeling approach. And we can train things like Markov models or conditional random fields or hybrid versions of discriminative and uh, generative model that I'm, many of you will know uh, an awful lot about that are used to uh, applying to different data which can tell us exactly this kind of thing. What's the probability that a word fits with our expectations of the kinds of words we're likely to see in this document, given some very shallow notion of structure as well, by the speech tag? And that can solve that kind of problem. But unfortunately, treating these things as sequences, and here's where language, I think, although you guys know so much more about this that you can probably tell me I'm wrong, starts to diverge from the sort of audio problems or vision problems that you're more used to, is that, in principle, we can build as predictive and as accurate a model of sequence as we like, and it doesn't capture a lot of the phenomena that we see in language, because language isn't just sequential. We saw that man bites dog and dog bites man mean different things, uh, because, and that we can capture that because the sequence of words is different. But obviously, man bites dog and no man bites dog mean entirely different things, right? One's like saying people bite dogs and the other saying it doesn't happen at all. But we've still got the same kind of small sequences of words in here. Now, you say perhaps you can capture that because you, just by looking at the probability of the sequence no man bites or something, we can learn a different model from that. But we can very easily think of an example that also has those sequences of words that, that again, doesn't mean the same as that. In fact, almost no man bites dog is telling us that somebody does. Right? It's kind of going somewhere between the meaning of these two and back to the meaning of the first. Or, I don't think man bites dog. I'm, you know, my language here is slightly rough. But it's very, very easy to think of examples <laughs> that have sequences of words that are identical to previous examples that mean entirely different things. And that's because language is full of what we call long-distance dependencies. The fact that don't think controls the kind of embedded sentence, man bites dog here, that almost is modifying no, and that no is modifying man, and so on. We actually need to know about the structure. And these structural dependencies don't just happen in terms of linear sequence. Linguists spend lots of their time thinking about examples like this. We have really extreme examples where words can be sort of moved out. The, well, sorry, words can be very strongly dependent or influential on completely other places, different places in the sentence. Who do you think we need to see? It's a very normal sentence, but it's talking about seeing someone. The C is actually <laughs> depending on the who, or the who is forming some role in the C. The man I sold the car to is coming. The man sort of has something to do with this selling the car to him over here. It fits into some weird place in the sentence. It's a very strong grammatical dependency, meaning dependency on this place in the sentence. It's nothing to do with linear sequence anymore. Right? It's to do with hierarchical structure. What does that mean? Uh, well, that means we need to start thinking about the syntax and the semantics again. Unfortunately, in a way, because that's a really, really difficult job to do. If we want to start taking care of these kind of structural dependencies, and we actually want to calculate meaning properly for each sentence as we go along, which is really the only way to actually get at what a document really means, and therefore do all of those tasks that we wanted to do at the beginning, if we really want to do them properly, then we've got to start analysing language syntactically so that we can attach the proper meaning to it, because you can only understand the proper meaning of things like negation and WH phrase movements and so on if you understand the structure. Now again, fortunately, lots of people have spent several decades working out really good ways to do this. Uh, and people have developed different grammar formalisms. If you're at all familiar with kind of computer languages and definite clause grammars, you'll recognize this sorts of things. We can write ourselves a grammar that says, well, we can make a sentence of some kinds of phrase, and those different phrases can be made of other different constituents and so on. And if we can put that together with some kind of uh, efficient parsing algorithm, <laughs> and if our grammar has reasonably robust coverage, 
and we can go and attach these kind of syntactic structures to the sentences we're interested in. If we're then clever enough to have worked out what the correspondences are between how these syntactic rules correspond to building up the semantics, the actual meaning, how these things affect each other to build up some representation of meaning, then we can even get out of this the proper semantic logical form that I mentioned right at the beginning. And this has kind of evolved to such an extent now that people have built grammars and parsers and syntactic um, matches between, uh, in, within the grammar that are really quite accurate, that depending on how you measure it and depending on what the data is, will get you kind of 80, 90% of the way to covering all your sentences and getting a correct meaning out for those sentences. But there's a really big problem that really somebody has to write that grammar. Or if they don't have to write the syntactic grammar, because there's been lots of work in grammar induction from corpora, where you can automatically learn these sorts of grammars, then perhaps they have to write the parsing algorithm. If they manage to learn the parsing algorithm, <coughs> they almost certainly have to write by hand the syntactic semantic correspondences that tell you how to get the meaning out. And that means that these things, they're great for one particular set of data, but they tend to be extremely, tend to be extremely language or, or domain specific. Excuse me. Sorry. Mm. That was the eight, difference between 80 and 90, um, and I'm trying to remember which way around it was. So it depends. They've got very good accuracy in assigning this syntactic clause structure, and I think, depending on the data, you, over 90%, at least these guys got, there's been some improvements since. Uh, it tends to be less accurate in actually extracting the meaning representation, because this can still... Even when you've got this kind of clause structure, you can still have an ambiguity of meaning, depending on how you resolve certain parts of it relative to other parts. So the accuracy tends to drop once you're actually looking at the meaning and trying to do something with it, of course, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know if 80 to 90% sounds impressive or not to you guys who work in vision or in audio. You might be used to really much higher numbers than this. I don't know, is recognizing image and video easier than that or more difficult? I have no idea. Um, but it's really impressive <laughs> for this task. It took people a very long time to, to, to get this far, um, honestly. So that's, that's natural language processing. And we can kind of stop now if you just wanted to know that bit. Um, but the take home message is there's been lots of research in applying machine learning to language processing and doing the kind of basic stuff, which generally means we're using things like language modeling or vector space models. Generally, although there's been some work in like syntactic, semantic, grammar induction. And it's really robust. And it can take the quite simple insights of the fact that we have words and sequences and classes of words and so on and do quite a lot with it. Produce methods that will do you things like document search, document classification, similarity, uh, speech recognition, language modeling, and so on, very, very well. But they tend to be quite shallow by their nature. They don't really give us a deep insight into what sentences and documents mean because they can't extract the meaning properly. And it's sort of in parallel, there's been an awful lot of research in handcrafting things like grammar resources, lexicons, ontologies, that will give you that deep meaning, but which tends to be really brittle. Um, again, I'm, I'm generalizing, but it tends to be quite specific to a language, quite specific to a domain. And the problem for, for us, as intelligent sensing people, because I'm assuming that what we're generally trying to do is sense like people's natural behavior and extract some meaning from that, is that almost all of this work has been done on text documents. So this problem of it being language or domain specific is a really, really big problem for us. As soon as you start to try to apply this to the way people actually talk in conversation, or the way people actually write in conversation, if we're looking at what they're doing on something like social media or the web. It's a really big problem. And most of these resources kind of no longer apply. Uh, which we um, let's have a little look at exactly why that is, I guess. So I'm interested, and I think probably most of us are really interested in looking at language as it's used in interaction, because that's people's sort of primary natural use of language, right? It's talking to people. Increasingly, we're doing that by writing rather than by speaking. There's an awful lot of data out there which is people writing, but writing very naturally, as opposed to writing uh, books, documents, um, which uh, is this kind of secondary use of language, right? It takes us longer, we think about it. It doesn't come out in, a, in an intuitive way. But we might be interested in looking at uh, people talking to computers, if you want to build systems that can respond. We might be looking at tracking people talking to each other, 
because we want to either have a security monitoring situation perhaps or we want to just serve people up with things they're interested in or we want to build some kind of system that uh, takes minutes in a meeting uh, or we might be interested in looking at the way people type to each other if we're interested in say finding people's opinions about products in social media but these are the kinds of problems that we come across and again I'm slightly glossing but I'm going to break them, break them down into three uh, major problem areas which the last is kind of complex and I think we won't have time to talk about um, but the first one is that dialogue is generally informal, right? It's primary language use. We talk as we talk to each other. We interrupt each other all the time. We use slang. We hesitate. There are disfluencies all over the place. It's not like written language. It really looks very, very different. Second is that when you start looking at dialogue, you realize that it has a structure of its own. And we're not just talking about sentence internal structure now, as I was before. It has a kind of high-level topical structure. We talk about one thing, and we slowly move on to another, and maybe we come back to something we were talking about before, and... We intermingle topics, but it has a topical structure. But it also has a very low level, what I'm going to call dialogue structure, that people ask questions and answer them. They ask clarification questions. They say things, or they um, greet each other, or they say goodbye. And the different ways we use sentences actually kind of have different effects on the dialogue, and they're only appropriate to respond to in particular ways. And they tell us they mean different things. So there's actually a structure to the dialogue on micro level, sentence by sentence. The third problem. Um, is the dialogue, and indeed language processing in general, right, is, is incremental. People don't do it on a sentence-by-sentence sentence way. Even as I'm talking to you, and this isn't dialogue, right, this is some weird form of monologue where generally I'm talking and you're just sitting there and receiving stuff, so it's a little bit like reading a document. But as you listen to me, you're building up some picture of what I mean on a word-by-word -word basis. You don't wait until I get to the end of a sentence and put a full stop there, and then run your parser, work out what the syntactic structures were, work out what I meant, and so on, and put it all together. Which, unfortunately, is the way that most of the methods for attributing structure to documents have been built. Because we always assume we've got the text. Almost all formal linguistics assume sentences kind of exist as monolithic things. But actually, that's not the way we do it. And so when you start looking at dialogue, you find that you have to start processing partial sentences. Do things as you go along. So first problem first, right? Dialogue, conversation, it's informal. It's not really representative of what formal language and text is like. The vocabulary that we use, the grammar that we use, when I say grammar, I don't mean kind of prescriptive how you're supposed to talk. I just mean actually the way that we use structures within sentences, which we all do. It's how language works. And the spelling that we use, if we're typing rather than talking, can be really unpredictable. Uh, and very, very different sort of what we might think canonical language use was, what you'd find in a dictionary, what you'd find in some grammar that you'd extract from text. Um, the interview was, uh, it was all right. It's a perfectly normal thing for me to say. This uh, means something interesting. It means I'm hesitating, trying to find my words. This was is somehow being replaced by an it was. This doesn't look like a grammatical sentence if I actually tried to parse it or attribute rules of grammar to it. But it's actually, it's fine, right? There's nothing wrong with it. We need to be able to parse stuff like this, and it does have a structure. You, can, you know the interview is the thing that was all right, even though this was interrupted. Start looking at the way people talk on something like social media, then things get even worse. Their spelling becomes very unpredictable. They invent new words. They invent new symbols to go with it. They're still talking in perfectly acceptable language, and we can understand what they mean, probably if we sort of know how it's pronounced. We're quite good at interpreting this stuff. But try throwing this at some kind of machine system that's been built using an ontology or a lexicon, it's clearly going to fall down immediately. Try throwing this at something that has some grammatical parser. Ooh, I'm not quite sure why the order of my bullet points has gone so weird. Um, this is, a, again, a perfectly normal thing that two children might say to each other in a playground. In fact, it is a recording of two children talking to each other in a London school playground. We reckon, we reckon, yeah, she looks like her, oi, 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 you know, oi, 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 you know the fraggles, yeah. It's an okay sentence. We reckon she looks like, she, she looks like the fraggles and we think she does. I don't, yeah, it means something like that. What chances are you going to get this by running it through some 80 or 90% accurate on newspaper text? It's not going to happen. 
this is adults talking to each other. I just said, look, you know, silly really, because I mean, he knew I had a couple of people, um, you know, Monday and Tuesday, before Monday and Tuesday, and uh, you know, you, got, uh, you need a couple of people as well, so if you don't mind coming over. And this actually carries on for quite a long time, but I had to cut it off. And th we don't actually have any problem processing this stuff, right? And it happens all the time. These are not funny examples. Uh, so vocabulary and grammar, uh, spelling, are all going to be very unpredictable. Even worse than that, it, language changes all the time. Um, a, an undergrad project I was involved with just recently just noticed this, that on Twitter in the last few months, people have started using this weird spelling of the word two with, with a little O in front of it. It's little O, numeral two, represents the word two, T-O. Uh, or the, the, the number two, T-W-O. And you can even use it in things like this, the word today, you can spell oh, today. Uh, and the word for, F-O-R, you can be oh, for. I, I have absolutely no idea why. Uh, I really don't get it. My best theory so far is that it's something to do with stopping spelling autocorrect. But I, I genuinely, I haven't investigated this, and I, I don't know anybody who has. And, it, you know, the, people didn't do this even a few months ago. It's, it's brand new. Um, and, uh, you know, we can read it. It's all right. So we're going to have to be able to learn this kind of stuff as we go along, in fact. Writing ourselves some list. Even if we wrote it very carefully for something like Twitter or for something like spoken face-to-face -face interaction, still isn't going to do what we want because things are going to change. Think about what happens if we're trying to sense face-to-face -face conversation, which means we're going to have to run this through a speech recognition component before we even get some words. I kind of glossed over the fact right at the beginning that actually, you know, the primary form of, word, of language isn't, isn't words at all. It's sounds, and we've got to go from sounds to words. This is an example from a project I was involved in trying to build a, an automatic meeting minute taker and running four people talking noisily around a table through a speech recognizer. And we come up with completely uninterpretable garbage, even using the best state-of-the-art speech recognizer we possibly could at the time, which was developed specifically for this project and was really, really good. We were, in fact, quite impressed by how well it did. But you get stuff like this. Do you have the comments, cetera, and er, the? The other is, you don't have, I do, you want. Oh, we of the timeline said is that. As soon as we start involving speech recognition, we know we're going to have errors. It's not always going to be this bad, right? We know we're going to have errors. So anything that's kind of sensitive to exact phrase rules or word placement is also going to break. So there's all sorts of reasons why handcrafted grammar or lexicon or ontology-based approaches are going to fall down work very, very well on text documents, but they're going to fall down when we start looking at the kind of data that we're interested in, whether it's written or whether it's spoken. So what we need is something that's really robust. It can deal with this kind of error. It can deal with this kind of change. It needs to be adaptable, which means we're going to have to apply some kind of machine learning. So you guys all know about machine learning, and you are going to say something like, well, that's fine. If we want to apply it to this, we can, because you've now told us how to sort of characterize text roughly as vector spaces. So we can by machine learning over those kind of representations. And of course, you're absolutely right. So if we've got a simple problem that we can characterize as a machine learning kind of problem, the kind of thing we're used to, then we can approach it that way. And it suddenly starts to make an awful lot more sense to approach it that way than to try and approach it in the kind of knowledge-rich structural approach that I was saying was so good earlier. So if we've got some sort of problem that we can classify, we can cast as a discriminative classification problem, which means we've got to know what the categories are we're trying to classify things into. We've got to have some labelled examples if we want to do this in a supervised way. We've got to have some idea of what the features might be, but we've already talked about that, right? Words might be discriminative features, at least to some level of accuracy. Then we can teach our machine to distinguish these categories itself. So, such a problem is the first one we talked about, yeah? Sentiment analysis. Let's say we've given some language, we've got somebody talking, we want to know if they're being positive about something, if they're happy about something, or if they're being negative about something, if they're really angry and depressed about it. People do often want to do this, right? You want to know if people are happy or not, particularly if they're talking about you or your company or some topic that you're interested in. So that's a binary classification problem. We know what the categories are, positive and negative, like or dislike, and we want to separate something into it. So we've got this insight we had right at the beginning, we can represent meaning in a geometric sense. 
by saying that the terms that appear in some document are dimensions in some feature space. And we're just going to classify that way. So if we've got a simple enough problem, this is going to work. It's even going to work for some sort of first approximation for words that we haven't seen before or usages that we haven't seen before. And for relations between words, if we can sort of just say well, the co-occurrence of a word in the text is a relation between words. So even with a difficult example like this, which is the kind of thing one sees on Twitter every day, somebody liking Justin Bieber, but actually being sarcastic about it and using some Twitter convention like a hashtag to express the fact that they're being sarcastic about it, we can learn a model that's going to cope with that. Give ourselves a feature space in which there are only two words, love and hash sarcasm, because we've now seen hash sarcasm in our data, so we know it exists. We can learn something that's a discriminative classifier, partitions the space in some suitable way, if we've got some labelled examples, so that we know that the word love on its own is good and tells us we have positive sentiment, but only if it's without hash sarcasm. If you get both of them together, it's a negative example. If you don't have love, it's always a negative example. You can see how this is going to work, right? It's that simple. And of course, it has got lots of problems. And the first is, as we mentioned before, we know language isn't that simple. Characterizing things purely as word features isn't going to capture everything because there are structural dependencies. Right? Remember, we talked about things like WH questions and relative clauses. But we know we can't parse this kind of data for the reasons that I've just said, although people have started trying. We may not be too worried about things like questions or relative clauses because you might think the language on Twitter is fairly simple. Actually, I assure you that's not true, but at least perhaps you don't care about all of the data. But you even have problems with simple things like negation, of course, when you start characterizing language as purely being represented by word features. There is a big difference, even in sentiment, that we would want to analyze between Justin's new hair is nice and Justin's new hair is not nice, right? This is obvious. But it's going to be more difficult than we think to learn a model if it only uses individual words to discriminate between those things. You would say, well, why don't you use incorporate some sequential nature, right? use features which are sequences of words. Partition this into pairs of words that appear next to each other, or groups of three words that appear next to each other, or groups of four words that appear next to each other. And then we're going to approximate this kind of dependency by capturing the structure. And you're absolutely right. And people have done this a lot. And it gives you hugely improved performance. But again, it's very, very easy to think of examples where it's going to fall down. You can insert words between the not and the nice, and it's going to change the meaning in all sorts of different unpredictable ways. It's not really very nice. It's not as nice as it used to be. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. So you would have to extend. Yeah, end ground features don't even get you so far. You can see what the problems would be. There are other clever tricks you can do, like explicitly trying to guess at the scope of your negation words, and then pretend that all the words that occur within the scope of that are actually the sort of opposite of that word, by right? inventing a new word which is sort of the negative of the word that we originally had. And this has actually proved to be incredibly, uh, surprisingly successful. You have to have a reasonably good way of guessing where the influence of this neg negative word ends. Um, but if you can do that, then you can actually get quite a long way. And the other thing you can do is just get an awful lot of data, which... Fortunately, with something like social media, if that's what we're doing, you can get an, millions and millions and millions of data points very, very quickly. And the more data you can get, the more examples like this tend to fade into the noise and you learn the generalizations, even given simple features. So there are things that we can do to get around this that don't actually involve attaching structure. If you are interested in doing this kind of thing, get, there's a very good tutorial by Chris Potts at Stanford which summarizes all of these approaches, gives you lots more detail on them. So that's one problem, but there are, so there are sort of slightly dumb ways of getting around them that can actually go quite a long way. Another problem, though, is this problem of labeling. So we've assumed that not only do we have a binary decision problem, but we've got lots of labeled data and that we know what the categories are. So that's the only way we can apply these kinds of approaches. Now, sometimes we're not going to know what the categories are anyway. We'll get back to that in just a second. But even when we do, which in most of the problems we're interested in here, things like sentiment or emotion or opinion section, we know what the categories are we're looking for. We've got a big problem of going and labeling our data. And I don't know how closely this relates to the problem you guys have in audio or video labeling. I don't know whether it's more or less difficult. But in language, 
So if we want to solve our problem by getting lots of data, as I suggested we should before, one of the problems we have is just that it takes an awfully long time to go and get lots of data if we've got to label it all by hand. Right? There are ways that you can get around that in today's world, perhaps by crowdsourcing annotation, but there are problems attached to that of reliability and so on. But it's kind of an even deeper underlying problem is that it's quite difficult sometimes for somebody who didn't write the text to begin with, or say the sentence to begin with, to actually know how to label it. It's quite difficult as a third party to understand what somebody really meant sometimes. This is an example as well. I, I think this is a reasonably representative example of something I came across the other day when I was trying to label some data in terms of whether the person writing it was particularly worried about something or not, which is useful for various applications. And some of the examples are really obvious. These, again, are Twitter messages. Somebody saying, I hope uh, somebody's name is OK. He hasn't texted me all day. I, as a third party, can read that, and I, I know he's worried about him. Right? Just as a human, I kind of get the common sense meaning behind it. Hoping someone's OK means you're worried about them. If they haven't texted you all day, that's something you might naturally worry about. But you get an awful lot of examples like this. So I'm worried people wouldn't turn up. Ha, 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 ha. I, I, I have no idea still, and I can't work it out whether this guy's worried or not. He might be. Maybe he is really worried, and this is some kind of nervous laughter. He might not be at all. He's just joking. He's going, yeah, I'm worried people wouldn't turn up. Ha, ha. Not worried at all. And you cannot tell, I don't think. Right? I could, without the context, without, and not just the immediate context, but a whole load of background knowledge about who he's talking to and so on, you can't get it. So it doesn't really matter if it's cheap to find crowdsourced annotators, if the, the job is not one that you can really do. And so this can actually, especially for texts that are short, which we're dealing with conversation, face-to-face -face dialogue, or social media dialogue, is going to be the case in general, it can be very, very hard to do. But there are some tricks you can do to try and get around this, and this is one that's become quite popular. Is you get the author to do the labelling for you, because they actually did know what they meant. If we can find some conventions, maybe they're words, but preferably they're kind of paralinguistic conventions that authors use to indicate their state of mind, the kind of category that we're trying to get at, then we can use them as not 100% perfect, but you know, slightly noisy, but reasonably good labels. And the kind of thing I'm thinking about are things like this little love heart, which tells you that this guy was happy. This hashtag, which tells you that he was angry, marking it with a hash means that, that that's kind of the theme of it, or it usually means something like that. It's very different to it just being a normal word, which might be in the scope of negation, or like saying, I'm not angry, whatever. This kind of emoticon, again, tells you about people's state of mind. We have things in different languages that look different. This is somebody being happy in Chinese. But people do a lot of this kind of thing, especially in text, because they're trying to replace the sorts of facial gestures and uh, prosodic intonation of contours that you don't get in text. So if we can go and identify a bunch of things like this, which actually tell us more accurately than we as third-party labelers could what category these texts belong to, then we can take them out. And now we have some implicitly labeled beautiful examples of text that are associated with those categories, with those emotions or those um, sort of sentiments or um, positivity and negativity. And now we can do exactly what we were before. before right? We can go and do learn a discriminative classifier. We can get lots and lots of data this way very, very fast. Millions of examples if we want, as long as we're not looking for something very rare. And for these sorts of things, sentiment, emotions, even opinions, things like agreement, disagreement, you can generally find conventional labels like this that do a fairly good job for you. They don't always work perfectly. In fact, they never work perfectly. They work more or less well. But then there are some other tricks you can do to improve the performance of your classifier, things like active learning or code training, um, which we're not going to go into now because not everybody will be interested. But this can give you a start from which to bootstrap from. Uh, at which point I do a quick plug for the fact that we've used methods like that to build a bunch of uh, social media classifiers for things like emotions, like anger and happiness and sentiment and excitement, 
um, that if you are interested in sort of putting this into an application, they're, they're there for you to use. They're wrapped up behind APIs and freely available. Um, so I do. Uh, and if you want to play with our iPhone app, then please go and download that. It's called Sentimental. And it uses some of these sentiment classifiers to go and tell you what's going on in your current neighborhood by finding geolocated social media messages and seeing what the emotions are in that. So you can actually do quite useful, workable, scalable, robust things by using quite simple methods, as long as you take into account some of the nuances of language, the fact that you have to be slightly clever about things like negation uh, and other kinds of dependency, as long as you're slightly clever about the labeling problem, uh, and as long as you have a good way of representing your features that isn't quite as dumb as words. So, we're getting short on time. I don't know what I should tell you about. Um, yeah, now maybe I will do this, and then we're not going to talk about the dialogue stuff, but that's okay. There's a third problem that starts to rear its head when you use these kind of methods on this kind of data. And again, I, I, the, one of the reasons I think it might be useful to talk about this now is because I don't know how closely this corresponds to problems that you guys might generally have in audio or video processing or image processing. I'm really not sure if this is the same or not. If it's, it's a real problem in language. And I, this is because of the nature of how language works. And you may have similar problems with audio and video, but I, I just don't know enough about it. But people have observed on language after language that in general it follows Zipf's law, which is that there's a linear relationship between the log of the rank of a word, how, how uh, common it is, how rare it is, uh, and the number of times that you're likely to see it. What this essentially means is that no matter how big your data set, there will always be words that you haven't seen. And if you get, make your data set a little bit bigger, you're going to find some new words in that new bigger bit of the data set that you didn't have in your original part of the data set. Right? The distribution of language is very exponentially rare. You will always discover new stuff whenever you add a little bit more data. Now, I guess that's not quite true if you're, say, processing an image and your features are things like pixel colors, but I'm probably just massively oversimplifying the job of image processing and I don't understand it. But it's, it's, it's something you have to deal with in language processing. You will always find features you've never seen before. They will always be, by definition, rarer than the things that you'd seen before. And this means, if you're doing kind of naive machine learning approach, you will find more chance correlations in a bigger data set with the thing that you were looking for, the category that you're trying to detect, than you had before in a smaller data set. And that means you've got to be slightly clever about how you constrain the features that you're allowing a machine learner to use. Because we want to produce something that generalizes to a bigger data set and that isn't purely producing some performance because of these kind of chance correlations that you may find. An example of this, so we had a project recently joint with the medical school where we were trying to apply these kind of techniques to predict, to detect uh, symptoms and predict people's behavior uh, in schizophrenia therapy. And the nature of our data set meant that we came across this in quite a bad way. So what we are trying to do the medical school have been running projects with uh, schizophrenics talking to their therapists for a long time because they do research into psychiatric therapy and how effective it is and into schizophrenia and how to treat it. And so they have lots of data of people talking to their therapists, which is also annotated with things like the symptoms that they were classified by the uh, medical experts as having, with how well they thought the therapy went, uh, how well the doctor thought the therapy went, and even six months later, how well it actually did go, whether the patient stuck with their treatment or not. Not sticking with your treatment in schizophrenia means you're four times more likely to relapse, I think. More than four. What we were trying to do then is learn models of the language and of the dialogue structure that would help us automatically detect symptoms and would then actually try and predict from the way people talked and from the structure of their, their language uh, this important future behavior, whether they start with their treatment or not. And so the kind of language you see in these dialogues, it's, it doesn't have the weird, unpredictable spelling that you get in Twitter or the, the, the strange conventions, because this is somebody having manually transcribed people actually talking to each other, so we don't have these odd conventions. But it does have 
vocabulary that you wouldn't necessarily know about if you were going to build yourself some general language resource. You have to know about things like drug names. But it also has kind of uses of words that uh, don't really correspond to what you might see in normal language. And it turns out that talking about television and messages in this domain means something very, very different to what it just normally would when you're talking about television in general uh, language. It is a very strong indicator of particular kinds of uh, what we call positive symptom, hallucinatory symptoms. So using kind of off-the-shelf dictionaries and grammars and parsers, again, wasn't going to be useful to us here, uh, even if you know, the, the spelling looks much neater. So we were using this kind of machine learning approach and doing the same sort of thing. But what we've got in this case is quite a small data set. It takes a long time to get data from, from this kind of domain. And there, there weren't actually that many different people, just over 100. But given the nature of language, and how rare words and combinations of words are, uh, an extremely large feature space. Many tens of thousands of possible features, if our features are thing, the things that we've talked about so far, words, maybe negated words, maybe kind of bigrams or trigrams, or mini word sequences. And what that meant was that if you just use that raw feature set to try and train a standard discriminative classifier to predict, or a regression model to try and predict people's behavior, it didn't really do anything. If you do something clever that machine learning people like to do, and language processing people like to do a lot, given the size of our feature spaces, select your features on the basis of something like information gain, some sort of measure of how well they correlate with your target variable, then it turned out we did really, really well. In the 80s or even 90% trying to predict the things that we were interested in predicting, detecting symptoms and predicting their behavior. But it turns out that quite a lot of this comes from the nature of the rarity of these features in our feature space and the way that we're selecting the features. It's very, very easy to find with a massive, massive feature space, which is going to be the case with language because of this Zipian nature and the sort of scale-free nature that language has. You're always going to be able to find features, especially when your number of instances is sort of relatively small compared to your feature space that correlate well, but it might just be by chance. This result looks beautiful, but isn't going to generalize to another data set. So what can you do there? Well, you can try and select features purely based on some subset of that data and then see if it generalizes some held out portion of your data which actually, weirdly, is a very rare thing to do in language processing, it seems to me. People don't really think about feature selection as something that really needs to be done over a separate set, which is slightly odd. But if you do that, indeed, we did find that our performance dropped an, an awful lot. Actually, I can't quite remember how much, but it did drop a lot. And that's because of this Zipfian nature again. When, as soon as we constrain to a particular set, you can now find even in the, in the smaller set, you have a different set of words that are now rare in that feature set in which you can find chance correlations with your target variable, which, of course, then may not even appear in the set that you want to test on. And that means you've got to do something slightly cleverer than that. Select your features over a set, but make sure that you're somehow excluding things that are likely to have these chance correlations in. One kind of dumb way of doing that is just purely excluding things that are rare. It's not a very clever way of doing it. There are almost certainly better ways. But if we did that, then we found we got kind of realistic and still extremely excitingly good performance, and that we find that that does generalize um, to hold out portions of the data set, and things will work very nicely. Uh, the very exciting thing about that project was that we could then predict people's future adherence to their treatment and recovery just as well as a human psych expert psychiatrist could, at least when given the same data and not given some video. But that's just a sort of cautionary note, and it's a, it's a problem that you come across when you're dealing with language data and applying the sorts of machine learning approaches that you guys are used to applying that is a problem that I suspect doesn't appear in quite the same way in the sorts of things that you do. So I'm going to stop now because it's Mark's turn. Um, but I think, I hope, this is what I've said so far, is that actually you can get quite a long way with this sort of language data using fairly standard machine learning approaches. 
mostly using the kind of features that would just intuitively occur to you as being sensible things to use, the words and sequences of words, and then actually learning stuff from data. And that's kind of what you have to do if you're going to deal with the sorts of data that you see in actual human talk, rather than things like text documents. But we've got to remember, we're always going to be very limited with these kind of approaches and the nuances of the language that we can get at. We really need some kind of structured model of meaning if we're going to get at those. We have a general problem of labeling, which we have to be very clever to get around. There are some tricks, as we looked at. We have a general problem in the Zipfian nature of language, that we have a feature selection problem we have to be very careful of. And, of course, none of these have really told us quite anything about you know, logical, semantic meaning of sentences. And if we want to get to that, we, we, we need something else. But that would be another talk. Thank you. To improve its, its understanding or improve its interaction. Yeah, so there's quite a lot of work going on in that at the moment, or at least in methods that could be used for that. I don't know if... Um, so one thing is in speech recognition, there's been a lot of work in adaptive speech recognition and adapting to improve the recognition uh, accuracy rates to someone's voice, which can be done fairly well now um, but, and fairly automatically without much supervision. But it actually in dialogue processing, in terms of, you're thinking of systems like Siri, which attempt to understand what you mean and do something effectively, yeah. Um, th there are very good reasons to try and adapt to people's vocabulary and use of language and even the sort of structures of, of dialogue that they use. And so there's been a, quite a bit of work on trying to adapt to people's uh, vocabulary uh, and try and actually sort of make sure that the machine uses the same words that the person uses, where there was some ambiguity between it. Um, and there are systems, uh, research systems, there's no commercial systems, there are systems that are starting to do that now. But the more general problem of trying to uh, adapt to people's language and what they mean by the way they say it is something, there's lots of research into doing that using reinforcement learning at the moment. So giving the machine lots and lots of examples of different dialogues where it tries different strategies to interpret or different strategies to give uh, outputs back to the user. And then once you've been able to measure which ones of them were successful or not, you can learn an optimal strategy for a particular person. At the moment, that's only in the stage of working brilliantly given many tens of thousands of examples. And obviously, you want it to actually learn and improve quicker than that. But as far as I know, they haven't quite got that far yet. So it's, it, that's a really big area of research. <laughs> 